Please remain standing and uh, open the pages of the scripture in your hand to the book of Isaiah chapter 1. Tonight we will begin our series through the book of Isaiah and this evening we'll be in chapter 1 verse 1 to 20. The book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 to 20. Hear the holy and infallible word of God. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O heirs, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with in iniquity, offspring, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened, softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your seats are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booze in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have, I had, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, of the lambs, or the goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this, this trembling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbaths and the calling of uh, convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has 
spoken. Let's pray. A gracious and heavenly Father, as men and women and children who are living in a similar nation, like the nation of Israel, then, and we read this chapter, we read these words, we, we tremble. We are in dread. It's only because of your covenant, your grace, that we are indeed at peace. But this is a very fearful chapter. And without the promise and the invitation that we see in this chapter, there is no comfort, there is no hope in this chapter but full of indignation. Oh Lord, tonight help us to understand this chapter, to relate it to our own life, but also the life of our nation here in America, and to do the right thing in your eyes, to hear you, to obey you, and to pray for this nation faithfully and in tears. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I mentioned to all of you earlier, tonight we start looking into the book of Isaiah. We begin to consider the message that God has for us in this book. The book of Isaiah is known as a mini Bible. It has six, six chapters, and the first 39 chapters would give you a, a, a summary of the Old Testament. And the remaining 27 chapters would give you a summary of the New Testament. So, if you don't have the complete Bible, anywhere you go, by God's providence, if you take the book of Isaiah with you, you have a mini Bible with you. The author, of course, is the prophet Isaiah, one of the major prophets in the Old Testament. And his name means, the Lord is salvation. Or the Lord saves. Yesa Yahu, the Lord is salvation. Isaiah is known by many theologians, he's known as a systematic theologian and a teacher of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And Isaiah was called to his prophetic ministry. You can look this in chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died. And his prophecy was directed to the entire nation of Israel, but especially to Judah and Jerusalem. And as we begin to look into this marvelous book in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, what we have in our text tonight is the indictment of God against Israel. God is making or bringing an official charge against his own nation, against the nation of Israel. Now, you need to know that the only church that existed then was the nation of Israel. There was no other church. The only church that God had at that time was the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And his own congregation, his own people, the nation that he created, rebelled against him. So the Lord, God, through the prophet Isaiah, comes to his people with this indictment or charge against his people. The indictment of God against Israel, 
God expressing His indignation over the sins of His own people and showing them the description and the consequence of their sin. But, because, but also because He's merciful, because He's gracious, He also shows them the remedy how he was going to restore them and bring them back to himself if they obey. So tonight we look into this indignation, into this indictment of God against his people under three subheadings. First, we will look into the rebellion itself, the problem, the sin itself, from verse 1 to 4. And then we'll look into the consequence of their sin, verse 5 to 8, and then we'll skip to 11 to 17. And then we'll consider the remedy that God provided for His people. So first, let's look into the, the problem, the, 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 the rebellious itself, or the rebellion. In verse 2, God said to the nation of Israel, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. So notice how God begins the indictment against his people by remind them who they are, by remind them about their relationship with him. So he started by telling them, don't you remember that I, God, the God of the universe, the Lord of this world, gave birth to the nation of Israel. I reared you. I gave birth to you. I, uh, I brought you up. I nurtured you. You are my children. I loved you. I cared for you. There is nothing that I haven't done for you. Not only I was the one who created you as a nation, I was the one who brought you up as a child to maturity, but I, I was the one who delivered your fathers from Egypt. I was the one who preserved your lives through the wilderness. I was the one who drove away all your enemies as you were entering the promised land. I did all these things for you. This is who I am towards you. This is our relationship. I am a father to you. But you have rebelled against me. You gave me, you gave your, your, your back on me. You have rebelled against me. Oh, that's serious. Very, very serious. Notice verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Like a, like a estranged wife to her husband. Now, what happened? What was the sin of Israel? Why is God so angry towards Israel? I'll tell you what they did. Right after they became a great nation, full of peace, prosperity, and tranquility, they were attracted to other false gods in Israel. Not only one false god, but multiple false gods. The first one was Ashtras, the god of sensual pleasure. Moloch, the god of physical pleasure. Mammon, the god of possessions and power. Baal, the god of intellect. They abandoned God and they followed after these false gods. Now remember the people of God. This is very important for your Christian life. People don't just leave God. People leave God to worship other gods. 
No one leaves God just like that for no reason. People leave God when they are attracted to other gods. Because people have to worship someone or something. By our own nature, we are worshipers. So if a person abandons God, if a person forsakes God, he's worshiping something else or someone else. You don't leave God for no reason. You leave God to worship other gods. Your mind and your heart is dominated by other God to whom you are attracted. That's why you leave God. That's why you abandon God. If you are turning from God, it's because you are turning to another one. There are other interests in your life dominating your minds and your hearts. They replace God. That's exactly what happened with the nation of Israel. All these gods that I mentioned to you, they replace the true and the living God, the God of the Bible. You remember in Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 18, God warned the people of Israel. He warned them, I will bless you, I will make you rich, I will make you prosperous. I'll bless you with intellect, I'll make you a great nation in the world. But God in Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 18, he told them, but after I do that for you, be careful that you will not forsake me. You will not abandon me. God knew the heart of the Israelites. God knows our hearts. God knows the heart of the nation of America. He's not surprised that he knows us. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, 2, Paul said, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of what? Self. They will live for themselves. They will live for the pleasures of life. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Isn't that what we see today? And then comes ungrateful, like the nation of Israel. You see, that was the problem. The problem was not only they went after other false gods, but they became so ungrateful, unthankful to God. After everything he did for them. Ungrateful, unholy. You know, this week, as I was studying this chapter, I was struck by the similarity between the sin of the nation of Israel and the sin of this nation, America. Do you know when the founding fathers came to America, fleeing persecution in England, because the state church in England would, would not let them to worship God uh, in the dictate of their own heart, in the light of the scripture. So they flee and they come to, uh, to this land. And they establish all the colonies. And when they were shaping the constitution, the one provision that they made sure that it will be included in the constitution was freedom of religion, freedom of worship. Then you know what happened, you know, you know the, the history, the courts in this land, they started to interpret the section on religious freedom differently. Not freedom of religion, freedom of worship, but freedom from God, freedom from religion. That was not the intent of the founding fathers. When the founding fathers put in God we trust on the coins 
of the currency of this nation. When they put a nation under God, I am fully convinced that they were thinking of the God of the Bible. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of providence. I'm not talking about their spiritual maturity. I'm not talking about whether they were sound believers or not. It doesn't matter. They acknowledged God in your constitution. They even separated church and state so that the, the state will not, will not be meddling in the business of the church. They do everything in their power by the grace of God to establish freedom of worship and religious freedom for every citizen in America. Now, look how the nation responded to God. Go to the street and ask any American what makes America great. And you find out how many Americans will tell you God. I have tried that in malls, parks, airports, bus stations. I have tried that. And the two prominent response that I received from the people were because of the economy and free enterprise. That's what makes America great. Now listen, I'm not making a political statement. I'm making a spiritual statement. We have turned against God as a nation. You remember when President Abraham Lincoln declared a day of prayer and fasting. And he addressed the nation. And I caught what he said on that day to all of you. We have been the recipients of the choicest blessing of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity we have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation ever has grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were, were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. This was in 1863. Where is America today? I'm sure every one of us would agree with the president. That was the sin of the nation of Israel. And I believe that's the sin of this nation. Turning against God. Being ungrateful to God. And then the consequence. Consequence of their sin. In verse 5, God told them, Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is is faint. First, let me point you to verse 3. How God shamed the nation of Israel. You know what he told them? He told them the animals, ox and donkey, outsmarted it. They even know their own owner. They recognize and they, they acknowledge their owner. But Israel doesn't understand. Oh, Israel is acting like, you know, worse than animals. Because ox and donkeys, they know who owns them. They know who provides to them. But you, my people, you don't understand. Why is that? Because both their head and their heart was sick. 
You see, this is, this is moral death. If your mind is not working, your heart is not functioning, you are dead. This is a spiritual description of God, a description of how the people acted. The two important parts of their body, head, head and heart, were not functioning properly. That's the reason why the nation lost its conscience for God. Even with America today, you see, national conscience for God is gone. It was the same with Israel. Deuteronomy 4.9 Only take care and keep your soul diligently lest you forget things that your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. So you see, the first thing that happened to them as a consequence of their sin is their whole being was, was sick. Mind and heart. From foot to the head, God said, you are sick nation, sick people. And then what? And then God rejected their worship. Isn't it sad? Isn't that sad? You know, they were going through, uh, through motions. They would go to the temple, they would sing, they would give offering and tithes. Uh, in verse 10, uh, God told them, What to me is the multiple of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. Then verse 15, notice. When you spread out your hands to worship me, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. See what God is saying? Yes, you come to the temple. But everything you do in the temple is hypocrisy. You know, worship is not about keeping attendance, my friends. Worship is not about being in church, being in the house of God. It's more than that. It's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's worshiping, worshiping God with your whole heart. And God said to Israel, yes, I hear you praying. I hear you singing. I see your sacrifices. But I hate them. When you raise your hands to worship me, to praise me, I hide, I, hide, I hide my face from you. Imagine God telling you, I hate what you do for me. Don't do it. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to bless you. No communion with you. Their worship was rejected. It was merely gathering, not from the heart. It was external. Hebrews 13, 15. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips. Lips that acknowledge his name. When you worship God, you must acknowledge who he is. You must recognize the work of his son, Jesus Christ. The power of his blood. We worship God through Christ, in the name of Christ and through the leading of the Holy Spirit. You see, they were not doing that because they were going after other gods, false gods. And that communion, that relationship with God was damaged. You see, uh, those uh, false gods replaced God. So Israel, my friends, had another husband. Not only one, but multiple husbands, multiple gods. You know, there, there were times in my ministry where wives, Christian wives, come to me. I, I especially remember one, one dear sister. One time she told me, 
She came to my office and she told me, uh, Pastor, my, my husband just told me he doesn't love me anymore, so he's moving out, you know, here in America. In Africa, you tell the wife to move out. Here the husband moves out. So this happened in America, and, and I asked her, you know what, maybe he's involved. Maybe he's attracted to another woman. And, and, and the sister said to me, no, 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 no. That's, uh, that's not the reason. After three weeks, she called me, and she said, yes, you are, you are right. He's attracted, he's involved. You see, Israel didn't leave God for no reason. And this nation hasn't left God for no reason. It's because the nation was attracted to other gods. Now let's come to the remedy. You know, so far it's, uh, st- <laughs> it's discouraging. It's sad. God is angry God is in wrath. The nation is sinning against him. And this is what surprises me as a child of God, as a pastor. The mercy of God. The grace of God. Notice the remedy. The remedy starts in verse 9. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors... We should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Who are these survivors? You see, in in the Hebrew language, they are the remnant in Israel. The true believers in Israel. You see what Isaiah is saying? Isaiah is telling the whole nation, the nation of Israel is not destroyed, it is not Remove it from the face of the earth only for this reason. Because of the remnant in it. True worshippers, true believers who love God. People who didn't turn against God. They are few in number. But because of them, God spared the nation of Israel from destruction. I want to encourage all of you tonight. How often do you talk about your church as as believers, as the minority? Oh, we are the minority. From tonight onward, I want to encourage you not to use that word. We are not the minority. We are the remnant. A reason of blessing, divine blessing for the nation. America is not destroyed. America is not perished because of you. You see, we are few in number. This is not a mega church. This is a small sized church. But you are a reason why this nation continues today. See what Isaiah is saying here? If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Why? Because they were praying for the nation of Israel as we pray for the nation of America. And then people had, God had people in the land of Israel. Who should hear the message of salvation through the remnant. And people has, God has people in the nation of America who must hear the message of the gospel through you. That's why America is existing. With all its wickedness and rebellious against God. But the greatest remedy, my friends, was this. 
in verse 16, God told them, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before your eyes, my eyes. Come, uh, cease to the evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Now, if we just stop there, well, everything I read for you from uh, chapter, uh, ver verse 16 to 17, would be what? Would be uh, works of righteousness. You can't cleanse your own life from sin. You don't have the power. You can't do that. Even though God is telling them that's a requirement. You need to be cleansed. You need to be washed. But he was not telling them to do that for themselves. That would be works. But notice verse 18. God tells them, I'm going to do it for you. If you obey, if you listen, uh, notice verse 18. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But if you listen, if you obey, this is what I'm going to do. Now, now listen to the greatest remedy. Invitation, you can call it. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Now let me ask you this. What is this reasoning with God? Come and let us reason with one another. Why is God reasoning with people who, who abandoned him and went after like three, four false gods? He must be angry. He must punish them. He must teach them a lesson as God. Instead, he's saying, oh, let's, let's have a meeting and reason with one another. Now, you need to understand, God is not calling them to his court. God is not saying to them, let us meet in my court. Let us meet at the table of justice. No, 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 no. If they come to his court, if they come to the table of justice, they will be destroyed. You can't argue with God. The judge of the universe... He will judge you. He will destroy you. You can't justify yourself before this holy and almighty and perfect God. No, 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 no. Not at the table of justice, but at the table of mercy. You see, he's addressing them as a father to children. You are my children. I'm your father. Let's sit together as a family and talk about this sin. What, what a love. It's like, you know, as a father or as a mother, you, you stand at the door, you know, a son or a daughter, a daughter rebels against you. You stand at the door. The moment the child comes, you open the door and then shut the door. You, you tell your child, I don't want to see you. Don't ever come to the house ever again. You shut the door. Or you open the door. Come, son. Come, to, let's sit. You, you, you put your arms around your child, sit around the table, and say, let's, let's talk about this sin. That's the table of mercy. The first one is not the table of mercy. There is no mercy in there. And that's not God. Yes, he's the judge. He can destroy but let me ask you this, why, why is he not doing that with Israel? Because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because of his covenant, he's addressing them. Oh, their sin was so deep. You see how God is describing their sin as a scarlet. Blood, red blood. It represents a murder 
whose hand is full of blood. That's your sin. But I will make it as whiter as snow. Because I love you. But you have to admit your sin. You have to forsake the false gods and turn to me. Then I will wash you clean. And this cleansing, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is the de demonstration of the work of Christ in justification. The work of the just God justifying the unjust through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. God was telling the nation Israel, the only remedy that you have, cleansing by the blood of the Messiah. The animal that you sacrifice points you to that Messiah. And I'm going to wash you clean, cleanse you by the blood of of the Messiah, and then there will be peace between me and you. You will be my children. I will bless you. I will restore you to myself. You see, the sacrament is a reminder of that grace, that mercy, that blood for us. Without what this sacrament reminds us, no one would be here tonight. No one would be here tonight. But God, through his son, Jesus Christ, called us to the table of mercy, embraced us. And he said to each and every one of us, let's talk about this sin. This is bad. This is terrible. You don't need this. You need me. So I want, to, I want you to forsake these false gods. Don't worship prosperity. Don't worship uh, physical pleasures. Don't worship intellect. Worship me. The one who gave birth to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration. The one who justified you. The one who sanctifies you. And the one who will glorify you. You see, that's the reasoning. The reasoning is to point them to the cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ. A point of application to all of us. Let me ask you this. Are you in any way attracted to another God in your life? Or only God, the God of the Bible? Is your mind, your heart, dominated by another God tonight? Or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And I also want to ask you, are you praying for America as a remnant? Oh Lord, please have mercy on our nation. Return. Return as our, un our un identity as your people. Raise men, even in the government, in churches, with the heart like our, found our founding fathers, who will stand not for freedom from God, but for freedom of worship. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, indeed, we too have turned against you. We are sinners. Apart from your grace, we always fail you. Individually, as a church, as a nation, we live under your mercy. The fact that you reason with us, with sinners, is the manifestation of your great love for us. Oh Lord, help us to love you, to cherish you, to worship you. Enable us by your grace and by your spirit not to forsake you, not to go after other false gods, but only after you, our God. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.